This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. And we're joined this week in studio by David Gordon, who's here uh, for a week or two visiting us in Auburn and teaching at the uh, seminar we've got going this week on the, on the, the book, Human Action. And since he's our in-house philosophy guru, I decided to, to bring him up in the studio and talk about just that subject. In other words, what sort of philosophy do Austro-Libertarians need to know? What are the books? What are the people? Um, uh, what should we be reading apart from just libertarian theory and, and economics, even if that's uh, a small measure of philosophy? So to begin, David, great to see you. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. For being here. It's great to be here at the Institute. You know, last week I talked to Joe Salerno and and, uh, Carl Friedrich Israel about human action a little bit, and we we were joking that part one of the book where where he's dealing more with uh, individual human action and praxeology is considered the more philosophical part of the book. Um, Obviously, he uh, he predated, Mises predated the two uh, really uh, big names in philosophy in the 20th century, which would be Rawls and Nozick. So Talk to us about some of the philosophers, German or otherwise, who influenced Mises and and who come through in this book. Well, Mises had a very broad knowledge of philosophy. He wasn't tied to any one school specifically. Now, a lot of people think, based on the first part of the book, where Mises has a somewhat Kantian view. He's talking about a priori mm-hmm. knowledge. They say, oh, well, Mises must be a Kantian. Uh, he was certainly a uh, used Kantian concept, but it, it's interesting in ethics, he wasn't at all a Kantian. He rejected Kantian ethics. It was what he called absolute ethics. He was in a tradition which he traced to the Greek philosopher Epicurus, which emphasized ethics as based on self-interest, and he saw himself as more in the utilitarian tradition of Bentham and Mill. So there, in ethics, he what he was more of an empiricist, and he also had a very uh, wide knowledge of other philosophers. That one philosopher, his influence on me hasn't been studied as much with Spinoza. He quotes Spinoza quite a bit, and there are some similarities in uh, this notion of action, what you get in Spinoza. And another philosopher of influence was uh, uh, the French philosopher Henri Bergson. He's very Mm -hmm. interested in him. Also, he knew uh, he was very interested in some of the ones in the the so-called who were uh, interested in the interpretation of sometimes neo-Kantians, but not always, like he liked the British philosopher R.G. Collingwood, Wilhelm Dilthey. So he had a very broad philosophical knowledge. He read most of the important figures of mm. his time. He knew American philosophy also. He cites Morris Cohen and Ernest Nagel. He, it would be very hard to get someone who was prominent that he hadn't read, really. Well, it's interesting, though, you say in the, in the realm of philosophy, he was more of an empiricist. And, in ethics. In especially. ethics. Yes. Um, speaking with Joe Salerno last week, he, he cautioned against overstating the case that mm-hmm. Mises was a utilitarian in his, let's say, in his political philosophy, saying that he was not a rule utilitarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on well, this and how uh, Mises saw this? Yeah, yes. Well, uh, Joe is certainly right that Mises. Uh, a utilitarianism is sometimes is as a strict system is a, a particular view of the ethics is objective service mm-hmm. there are true and false propositions in ethics and the true what we ought to do where this is something is true is what uh, maximizes happiness or pleasure now mises didn't accept ethics in that sense he didn't think there was a, an ought that's an absolute ought that's telling us what we ought to do. He thought that it just that, it, as a matter of fact, indivi- each individual desires his own happiness. So the way people can achieve that is through cooperation through the free market. So it wasn't okay. a system like you, Joe is so learning is perfectly right. It wasn't a system where you keep trying to calculate the uh, consequence, say, well, this policy will produce 
X amount of utility and this will be X minus Y, so we should do X. It was more that he thought that we can show that uh, the free market will benefit everyone or nearly everyone, so uh, we have interest in the long-term interests of everyone to adopt that. So it was really a very simple view of ethics, but it's far-reaching in what it implies. So it's more that in ethics, he's more interested in clearing away opposition to the free market. So when he's writing about ethics, what he's mostly doing is trying to refute various theories that go against the free market and arguments that go against the free market. And do you think he was right? Do you think he was correct in his approach, at least uh, for for his time? Uh, I think he was right to, in his rejoinders to the critics of the free market, but I would tend myself to think there's, uh, I would place uh, more weight than he did on uh, ethical judgments being true or false in a straightforward sense. And other uh, people like Murray Rothbard, Hans Hoppe have developed uh, views of ethics that are also ver- at least as much free market as Mises that mm-hmm. don't have this uh, what you could call instrumental view of ethics where it's just how does uh, how does uh, the free market help each individual fulfill the ends he happens to have uh, in the uh, say in the view of Murray Rothbard uh, there are uh, goals or ends that people ought to have and then the free market is a way of assisting those. So they come to the same conclusions but they get there in a somewhat different way. Well, let's talk a little bit about the 20th century. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the two big names are John Rawls mm-hmm. and Robert Nozick. Nozick mm-hmm. um, m- summarize briefly for us Rawls' his, his, his theory of justice and the idea of a veil of ignorance and, and his uh, overlay of, a, of an egalitarian component upon what's, what's philosophically or ethically moral for society. Oh, well, what Rawls was trying to do, you see, in the period before his book, Theory of Justice, came out in 1971, uh, a lot of writers in ethics thought that ethics was just confined, in philosophy, thought ethics was just confined to analyzing the meaning of ethical terms. They tended to be skeptical whether you could have substantive views, uh, philosophy could have substantive views of what is the right or wrong course. So what Rawls Mm. proposed in Theory of Justice, he said, uh, one way we might try to find out what uh, just institutions are is uh, we could imagine self-interested people who were deprived of any knowledge of their abilities or position in society at uh, what they if they were bargaining uh, in this condition of ignorance of their own uh, attributes and positions he called this being behind the veil of ignorance what they would come up with and the idea is uh, say if you say if you knew everything about yourself you're bargaining with someone else on base of self-interest right. then you'd try to come up with something to your own advantage. Like we could imagine if LeBron James is try bargaining, he would try, like something that emphasizes great athletic ability. But if we don't know anything, then we could get terms that were fair to everybody. They wouldn't be biased against everybody. So what Rawls came up with in the theory of justice, he said, well, people would agree to two principles. One would be uh, a equal liberties for everybody. And the second would be the difference principle. And the difference principle has two parts. One is that there have to be the uh, uh, jobs and positions are open to everyone, equal opportunities. And then inequalities have to be to the advantage of a least well-off group in society. And the basic idea there is that if some people do much better than others, it isn't because those people deserve that. Right. It's uh, really a matter of luck. They can't say, look, uh, I want my money. I did, uh, I've worked for this. 
uh, you can't take it away from me. It's a matter of luck. They happen to be gifted with certain desirable attributes. So Rawls doesn't say we should have absolute equality because that wouldn't be to the advantage of everybody. It's the advantage of everybody that the uh, people with more abilities be able to make more than others because then they'll work more, produce more, but the inequalities have to be to the advantage of everybody else. So what he came up with was really uh, it, there's some room for questioning about what exactly the institutions were he favored. It would be either a form of welfare state capitalism or a kind mm -hmm. of market socialism. But it, it'd be, it wouldn't be a free market, which he called a system of natural liberty. It would be one where you have a, 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 some sort of market, but it's corrected so that uh, people, uh, to the advantage of those who were at the bottom. Well, how do you think his uh, theory of justice holds up? It's what forty-five odd years later. I, I never heard heard Burry, Bernie mention Rawls. Is he still the darling uh, of the left? Well, I would say in academic philosophy, he's still very much the top mm -hmm. figure in political philosophy. There have been people who reacted against him. Uh, there's some people who criticize him from the left and say, "Well, he's just trying to uh, come up with certain." just devise certain institutions for society as if he's a member of a, kind of some sort of superior elite and what we really need to do, have more popular revolution. Like Sheldon Wolin, who, was a, who died recently, who was a very influential political scientist, takes that line. Others do as well. But in uh, political philosophy, I'd say he's still the dominant figure. You're either pro Rawls or... There's all sorts of variations on various uh, things he said. And then there's, he wrote a later book which stresses what's called public reason and their uh, attempts, how does the later Rawls modify the first Rawls? So there's all sorts of uh, uh, debates on him. The one leading journal called Philosophy and Public Affairs is very Rawlsian oriented. But I mean, there are people who do other things, but I'd say definitely still the most influential approach. Now, from sort of the individual liberty side, of course, mm -hmm. there was a man you knew personally, Robert Nozick, uh, author of Anarchy, State, and Utopia, around the same time as, mm -hmm. as Theory of Justice. Um, his philosophy was very different, viewing individuals as ends unto themselves. And, and what strikes me about this book is even though it's philosophy, it's very much about the state. Um, uh, in its thrust. So tell us a little bit about Nozick, how you knew him and, and, uh, and what he stood for. Well, I met Nozick in 1980, March, in April 1980. I'd gone to see him. Uh, he was a very unusual person. He was tremendously fast in argument. And he, he, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't interested in just in political philosophy. He was interested in practically anything. He wrote on uh, theory of knowledge, uh, metaphysics, he's free will problem. He has all sorts of things. He, he just could absorb material tremendously fast. And you mentioned he writes a lot about the state. And one reason he did that is he met Murray Rothbard and he was very he, he impressed by libertarianism, although he actually didn't get along very well with Murray Rothbard personally, but he was very, very impressed by libertarianism. And in the first part of Anarchy, State, and Utopia, what he's essentially doing, although he, he just mentions Rothbard very briefly, he's arguing against Rothbard. He's saying, his basic argument is, all right, let's start off with a a narco-capitalist system, and he thinks he can show that this mm -hmm. would lead to a very limited state. I don't think the argument is successful, but what he comes up with isn't much of a state, but he's really starting from a, uh, a, a Rothbard's position. So okay. he's thinking with him, it, he, he thinks that people have rights that can't be violated and he believes in acquiring property in a basic uh, Lockean way but he thinks there are problems that the Lockean theory haven't hasn't been fully uh, worked out but the 
what he would, his basic answer to Rawls, which is in, there's one chapter that's uh, distributive justice where he re responds to Rawls. He says, Rawl is, Rawls is wrong to, when he argue when he says, well, look, we don't deserve our abilities. Rawls is wrong to think that in order to show we should get the uh, wealth or income, we have to show that uh, our what we get stems from sort of moral mm -hmm. attributes that we have, so we deserve. It's enough that we can show they come from a just system of property acquisition. So Nozick favors what he calls a historical theory, which is people acquire their property on on a historical process, you get the property because you justly appropriated or acquired it in gift or exchange from someone who has through some chain of transactions. So it's a very, in, the thing I think is very interesting about Nozick, although he's, in the book he has, uh, in, as I mentioned, he's extremely fast, extremely sharp in argument. It's a very spectacular book, but the basic framework is Rothbardian in the way he's arguing for property rights. And it's just a limited uh, deviation from Rothbard in that he favors this very minimal state as mm -hmm. opposed to the state. So he's basically taken over a lot of Rothbard's framework, but just uh, dressed it up a little and put in very uh, arguments that would appeal to other analytic philosophers. And it, it was a very influential book, not nearly as influential as Rawls because Rawls's book because it's so alien to the uh, political views of most philosophers who were quite right. left-wing. Right. But a lot of people were in contemporary philosophy became aware of libertarianism through his book. I should say, uh, surprisingly, uh, it hasn't been as influential, especially after the first few years it came out, among libertarians. I think m many libertarians today don't read Nozick or don't study him much. And I, I think this is a mistake because he was an extraordinarily uh, smart person. Uh, one story, if I can give you, uh, there is a one of the greatest figures in American philosophy days, uh, Saul Kripke, who's considered a real genius. Uh, everybody looks mm -hmm. up to Kripke. So uh, Nathan Salmon, who was a philosophy of, leading philosophy of language, philosopher of language, once told me that Kripke had said to him, uh, uh, Nozick is the smartest person I've ever met. And I thought, oh, I'll tell uh, Nozick this. He'd be happy to hear this. Right. I, told, I told him that. He said to me, that's why he's trying to destroy me. <laughs> well, you said he's also a charismatic and handsome guy, right? Oh, oh yeah. Yes, he was. Uh, I remember Philippa Foote, who was a British philosopher, was telling me she'd been, he, he, she, she was at the Stanford, uh, I think, uh, visiting, and he came to see her, and, he, and she said, there he was, standing like a Greek god. <laughs> Well, so what kind of events would you have interacted with him? What, 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 where were you when these when you met him or, oh, or well, saw him? Well, I had just gone up to see him in his office at Harvard. And okay. I, I stayed in touch with him. I would sometimes uh, visit him, you know, when I was on trips, you know, but I, I knew him pretty well over 20 years. I remember one funny story. There was a conference put on by the Mises Institute in, uh, I think, around 1986 or so or 87 on Marxism that was held in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So uh, during that conference, I had lunch with with Nozick, and then uh, he walked me back to the conference center where the mm -hmm. where where uh, we were having our conference, and I wanted him to come down and say hello to people, and he was hesitating at the top at the top of the stairs, and he didn't come down because he he and R Murray Rothbard didn't get on so well. But I can see the picture of him standing in the stairs, you know, wondering should he go down or not. Well, you know, it's uh, for again forty odd years on since he wrote the book. Uh, a, apart from Anarchy State in Utopia, what other? Just a couple of of one or two key books that you might suggest to to austro libertarians who who aren't going to read much philosophy but but need to read something. Well, uh, one 
uh, you know, of course, he's one who's very much associated with the Institute. I, I like very much his Hans Hoppe, uh, uh, Ethics of Capitalism and Socialism, very good book. I think Hans is has is someone who, like uh, Mies and Rothbard, has a very broad knowledge of philosophy, and he has uh, philosoph he's emphasized philosophical foundations, and he has a lot of original ideas and interesting ideas. Now, there was a couple of philosophers, uh, Doug Rasmussen and Doug Denial, who've written books from an basically Aristotelian, Randian, somewhat Randian perspective, like one is Norms of Liberty. And I think they have a very, they, they're very good to read. Uh, they, uh, one thing that Doug Rasmussen is very much stressed to me, and he's critical of some of the newer libertarian thinkers, younger libertarian philosophers, is he thinks, and I think he makes good case with it, a lot of the younger people uh, neglect the basic foundational work in uh, metaphysics, theory of knowledge, that you need to establish rights. They'll just jump in and try to deal with the contemporary controversies, but they're, they're not doing the basic foundational work that uh, really have to do. Now, one philosopher I like very much, but he's very much not a libertarian, but I think if you're interested in... Mm -hmm. uh, in some of the other areas of philosophy besides political philosophy is uh, Thomas Nagel. I think very highly of him. He's uh, one called the View. One book if you, I like is View from Nowhere, and he has a, let's say, collection Mortal Questions. Very good to read. Uh, Elizabeth Anscombe is a very good philosopher. She was a British philosopher. Uh, Philippa Foote is very good in ethics. I mean, uh, I'm basically uh, I. Aside from Anscombe, who I just heard lecture a couple of times, I'm really recommending people I know, but those would be some I think would be good for people to read. Well, let's fast forward a little bit to today. Um, I, I can't imagine what things are like uh, in a philosophy department at a, at a typical mm -hmm. state university. I don't know what they teach. I don't mm -hmm. know what they talk about. Um, but maybe we get a glimpse of this from um, Jordan Peterson if you know that name, the University of Toronto professor, he's actually a psychology professor, but he talks a lot, you know, he's, he like the other day, I heard him bring up Jacques Derrida. Uh, yeah. In other words, this, this sort of uh, postmodernism deconstruction. Um, t talk a little bit about uh, modern present day philosophy, the state of it. Uh, well, in strict analytic philosophy, uh, th things are better than in some other departments, although there's uh, what's happened in some of the other departments, and to some extent this penetrated in philosophy, is there uh, certain movements such as uh, uh, certain versions of feminism or uh, studies of uh, var uh, variant types of sexuality or uh, ethnic studies. And these groups have definite views on what's appropriate or not appropriate. And it's not only that they advance certain views that those who don't agree with them might find strange, it's that they insist that no one differ with them. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. if, say, you held, say, say you didn't think that uh, uh, there was massive discrimination against uh, various women in the academy, you, it's not only that your view is wrong, but you shouldn't be allowed to express that view. And if you did, they would try to uh, shut you down and prevent you from speaking. So now, to some extent, this is penetrated into philosophy. For example, there's a, a philosopher of language, uh, Jason Stanley, who's a very influential figure. He's done very good work in philosophy of language. But he published a, a book where he seems to suggest that uh, certain words, if you use certain words in discourse, that shows you're trying to mm -hmm. unfairly influence mm -hmm. other people. It's been carried to such an extent, say, that Sally Haslanger is another uh, philosopher said, if, say, if you speak, people speak of mother, this is bad because it suggests that uh, 
people who have uh, uh, given birth, say, through some non-standard biological way, aren't as good as right. natural mothers. So it it's an insistence that people have to use a particular, not only express certain opinions, but have to use a certain vocabulary. And if, if you don't, it's not only that... Uh, they think you're mistaken, but right. they'll try to stop you from saying what they think you shouldn't say. But this is this is across all academic disciplines. Oh, oh yeah, at yes, this I point. mean. Uh, uh, let, let me ask you this: uh, What do you think of, and have you read much, Jason Brennan? Um, I know you know he has a, a book uh, a ter- titled, I believe, "Against Democracy," yeah. which I like the sound of it. I haven't read it, but I have read a review of it in the Claremont Review of Books. Uh, mm-hmm. Any thoughts on Jason Brennan? Oh, oh yes, well. Georgetown professor, for those yeah. who don't know. Yes, he's a very productive person. He got his degree under uh, David Schmitz, who's a classical liberal philosopher at University of Arizona, and who runs a, the top-rated uh, political philosophy department in the U.S. He's very productive. He's written a number of books. He's fairly, quite libertarian in his views. I think he's, he's quite smart and uh, mm-hmm. writes well, but he tends, in my view, he's very uh, to very much underestimate Murray Rothbard. He'll publish sometimes attacks on Murray Rothbard. And he completely misinterprets Rothbard because the way he has it, it's something like Rothbard just, dedu- just deduces very odd ideas just from some rigid understanding hmm. of the, what, the non-aggression principle. And He'll come up with cases like this. He says, "Well, uh, supposing uh, it would somebody just uh, you're running from a, a wild animal and comes into your uh, needs to jump over your fence, would Rothbard say you can't do that because you're violating the person's right. property?" And of course, uh, Rothbard was just writing about what is the appropriate legal framework. He wasn't trying to say. Uh, what are the principles you should use in deciding individual cases, how we should react in individual situations. He fully recognized in in individual situations how you know how you might apply the rules would vary. The point was just to establish a framework. Now, in mm-hmm. Brennan's own work, and this is uh, he tends to uh, just he tends to stress in my opinion a bit too much uh, how do you win an argument or how do you persuade someone else to adopt the conclusions you want? So what he says, you have to start with certain premises, sort of very premises everyone will, ex- some the person will accept and then okay. draw conclusions from it they'll find surprising. So it would seem more like that becomes more important than establishing whether your premises are true in the first place. It's more uh, emphasizing more of a rhetorical way of proceeding. Whether the listener accepts them as true. Yeah, yes. I mean, he will say something like, uh, and there's another philosopher, Michael Humer, who's very good, has a similar approach. Like one thing they would say is something like this. Uh, okay, supposing there are certain drugs you think people shouldn't use, you think it's wrong, say, for people to use heroin, Mm -hmm. would you think you have the right to lock people up in a cage because they're using those drugs? And then they'll say, well, if you say no, then why would you think the state can do that Mm -hmm. either? And I think that's a good argument, except a problem with it is if you say that, people might say, oh, no, I wouldn't have the right to do that because that's the job of the state yeah. to do that. So if you say a problem with that way of proceeding and kind of a, just going just by individual cases is uh, somebody could just uh, not come up with the same judgments about the cases as they do. Or another problem is somebody could say, okay, these are the conclusions you draw from the cases, so I'll go back and revise my views of the initial right. judgment. And I mean, they're aware of that uh, problem, but I don't think they really 
solve it as much. And I tend to think that if people that while there's certainly people like Brennan is certain Brennan is certainly worth reading, uh, it shouldn't be to the extent of neglecting the really outstanding figures like Rothbard. I think even Nozick, I mean, Brennan respects Nozick, but I mean, Nozick is, I mean, really was one of the outstanding philosophers in, I think, that's the people you need to be concentrating on. Sort of the, these are uh, these are more figures who were uh, that uh, who were not, in my view, as significant as the previous generation. Well, David, with that, we are out of time. Thanks so much for joining us, and ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.